Hunting Outdoors Tips and Tricks. Uh, I'm here with Mark Smith and we are going to uh, talk about burning your woods. And uh, Mark, tell us a little bit about yourself and then what, why would people want to burn their woods? Oh, well, um, in the real world I, I run a bicycle shop, uh, but I at one time was, I did wildland firefighting for a number of years full time. Um, and I just really liked it uh, when I moved back to the Midwest. Um, I kept in touch with it and did seasonal work with the Fish and Wildlife Service here. Got into doing a lot of prairie burns, control burns, and some timber burns. And so it's just a side hobby, really, that I do. And um, I had a lot of people over the years, oh, for years and years, asking me, you know, can, can you burn my prairie or can you burn my timber? Um, and after a while, I, I said no for a long time, then I, I said yes, and uh, started about seven or eight years ago helping people out with that, um, as well as doing burns for the state and the feds. Um, and uh, of course, there's a lot of benefits to burning your land. Um, I'll just say right off the bat that there, there's a lot of help financially for doing burns. Um, the EQIP programs, uh, the CRP programs, all provide certain amount of monies towards different types of conservation practices, and uh, you can look into that. Um, but uh, for timbers, um, there's let's see. I mean, there's a good number of reasons, but I would say that the the main thing um, is to uh, knock out some of the understory, uh, the shrubs, the brush, the mobile flower rose, um, prickly ash, some invasive species um, that can stress. Um, some of the native species are more fire adapted um, and they're not as affected as much and uh, so they, they get a little leg up basically. And a lot of what fire management is is allowing uh, plants mostly uh, maybe a few animals, but mostly plants a leg up so, you, so they can get reestablished um, and, and it's always a big competition out there. So um, it, it's a fairly low stress, low cost application that you can do every probably three to five years um, and, and if you take a long view uh, and maybe couple it with uh, thinning or Chopping, I don't know, and chopping into timber, maybe not so much, but there's other practices you, you can do to open up timber. Um, uh, maybe spraying, you know, going after things. And you work all that stuff together, you know, every year you got a project you're working on, um, you know, in 8, 12 years, uh, you can get a profound difference for the amount of input. So. Yeah, we, we've done TSI on this and now we're going to do this burn, so I'm hoping the burn will clean up a lot of that deadfall on the ground and then, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're, we're, I'm really hoping that, uh, you know, I've got some invasive multiflower rose and I've got some uh, wild mustard gar or garlic mustard and I'm hoping that that, you know, at least gives me a clean slate to start working on that. And then I'm really curious to see what what grows uh, up that I didn't have. Yeah. It'd be interesting. One thing I encourage people to do is, is keep a log of their property or a, a video log or a photo log. If you have photo points throughout your, you can just every time, every day, it's basically the same year. Or every, each year you can go out and take photos in the four directions. And you just do that year after year and you can see really easily the differences huh. that occur. Interesting. Um, I, because I'm, it's, you know, I do different burns and I'm around, I don't do that uh, for each burn, but I try to keep track of things. And I have some repeat customers over time and it's kind of a long game, you know, a lot of people will say, well, I'm 80 years old, I'm going to be dead by the time this comes back into, you know, mid-management practice. But thanks, you know. <laughs> so yeah. I don't, you know, I don't know, but uh, I do do some work uh, with uh, the city of Fairfield and the county of Jefferson County, and that's really where uh, 
because we're doing stuff every year, year after year, that's where you start to see, you know, you start to turn the corner. And um, it's also, it's nice, you know, you, you see people go by, like say the loop trail on the bike trail every year, year after year, and then they'll come into the bike shop and they'll say something like, oh my gosh, I don't know what they've done out there, but that prairie is amazing, you know, and a lot of them don't even know I burn or do anything like that. And, and so it's a nice thing to hear and, and see that it works. And um, it's a really good tool for areas that um, you don't have a lot of money for or it's just too much work. You, and uh, you, want a, you want a natural sort of native environment anyways. Um, you can start to encourage the native species and sort of a, a more balanced expression of the land. I mean, you're not going to have perfect savanna sort of prairie everywhere because things are always changing, but you can start in that direction. Yeah. And uh, it's something that also I, I encourage landowners once they get an idea um, maybe they see me do it or they see some people do it. They can do it themselves with some tools and give them some advice, you know, start it. It's, um, they, there's checklists you can do to sort of get you a no-go or a go-no-go. No um, that really helps, you know. Let's, let's kind of talk through that. Um, what, are, what are kind of the basic steps to a fire burn and then, then, we'll, then I'll ask you about what equipment. Um, that you guys use because uh, you got some unique equipment that I really appreciate. Um, let's see. So, we talked about why, you know, why you burn. Yep. Um, you want to sort of have the reasoning down, and um, a lot of times, you know, in the CRP or something, the government's sort of dictating what you do. Um, but if, it, if they're not just doing a requirement, then we talk about whether that's a good fit. You know, sometimes I just say that's not a good fit. It's, it's, it's rare, but um, that's that's the place to start. And then you got to figure out, uh, um, you know, you've got your unit and what you're trying to achieve. You know, like, do you want uh, like a sort of a monoculture or just a few? you know, like a bunch of big blue stem, for example, or do you want a diversity? Um, you can do burns all different ways. You can go for like scorched earth policy. Uh, you can go for like a mosaic patch burn. Um, it's kind of like what you're trying to do. And uh, also what's going on there. You know, like um, woods are good if you don't just torch them because the animals depend a lot on things in there. Um, the, the prairies, you can, you know, they'll burn clean. Uh, mostly you got to worry about doing it too late when they start to, to nest, the animals or the birds start to nest. Um, so you get those ideas there and then you have to um, put in fuel breaks around your unit and you have to look at um, the adjoining properties, roads, um, towns, and anything that where that fire uh, is going to affect the smoke and that sort of thing. Um, and you guys use some <clears throat> some rakes, but uh, you really use like leaf blowers, right? Back backpack leaf blowers for the um, most part to build those breaks. Yeah, leaf blowers work really well in leaf litter. Uh, basically, uh, just a small saw, some kind of a tough rake like they have, uh, they're called like the clouds and uh, what is it called, uh, the rake we use the most. Basically it's just a sickle mower blade that's cut off short and attached to a stick and you can just hack and work that thing really well. But any kind of heavy duty rake, uh, your leaf blower and your saw and you can just go down and clear down the bare mineral soil about a, anywhere from three to five or six foot wide. Uh, path and you kind of want to clear the leaves away from the fire more if you can so you don't get a big drift right there um, and you want to kind of disperse the leaves so if you get a high wind um, you don't have leaves drifting back over your line because you know a lot of times you'll prep your line sometimes months in advance in the winter okay um, and if you just 
kind of just careful about it. You, you don't come back and all the leaves have drifted back in, or so much that it can creep across your line. Yeah. So, sure. Yeah. So you get your line in. Um, you identify your burn window, um, more or less uh, around here, meaning what is it? The about around 92 longitude, 40 latitude, basically northern Missouri, southern Iowa. Oh, I would say um, March, really, from about March 1st to March 20th. That's a good time. Um, things get start to green up too much. Um, it's getting later on, and, and uh, of course, like they were saying, you get to turkey season. A lot of people don't want to have you burn right before turkey season for obvious reasons. Um, and if you do it too soon or too early, um, it can work, but uh, you don't get the same effect. You don't get the same stress on the plants where the sap's starting to run and that sort of thing. You can really stress some things. So that's, and it depends on where you are. Like, you know, if you're down in southern Missouri, Arkansas, they're burning in January, you know, and it just sweeps up. Um, and so, then you gotta um, look at the weather. You know the weather's huge, but that dials into more. You got a range of time, and then you're just looking at. You gotta identify certain uh, wind directions that you can do it. Certain wind speeds. Um, you know you gotta look at frontal passages and how long the wind's gonna hold. You want a steady wind. You have better luck doing a, a burn in a strong, steady wind than in a light, variable wind because you can control it more. You know, once you get that line burned off, your backing fire established, you know what's going to happen. But if you got light, variable winds and you got slope, it can kind of create its own situation, which can be dangerous. Um, and then you got to, uh, you just got to, usually you got to contact neighbors. You got to contact fire departments. Um, there are checklists you can, like I said before, you can go through that are really helpful to to dial in uh, on whether to do something or not. Uh, they talk about humidities a lot, um, and there's it, it can get really involved. But uh, the Iowa State Extension and I saw the NRCS for their equipment application had a, a real basic no-go check, go no-go checklist that would work really well for um, if you were doing a burn and you wanted to figure out when's a good time to do it. So, Yeah, what I, what I thought was interesting, when, once you started the fire, you, you lit the fire, back burned, is that the right terminology? Back burned yeah, it, you set it back on. into the wind Yeah. So you got a good break and then yeah. kind of went on the other side and started it and the wind took it and go from there. But you manage the fire. I'm out there with my rake, but uh, you guys didn't have rakes or anything. You guys carry, you're carrying uh, backpacks, sprayers. Yeah, yeah. And um, leaf blowers. You know, in timbers, it's a little bit tough. Um, on bigger burns or down, down where you got in the south or east where you got more deciduous forests and they do bigger burns, they'll cut a wider path for ATVs and stuff like that, that to get in there and to have water with that. But um, Basically, uh, with leaf litter, you can you need a little skill, but you can do a lot with leaf blowers to put a fire out. Um, but you're mostly limited to putting out a flanking fire with a leaf blower, which means not uh, fire back and into a wind. You're trying to put that out. You just blow it up, and then it blows back over your head. Um, but if the fire's kind of going away, and, and you can work up a flank, of whatever it is going away, you can put it out. Um, now you need to have a little more expertise because you're putting head fire down and you know it's going to hit something hard so you know you, you have to have a solid boundary that you're going to run it into and that you can catch it and those are, but water is the surest bet I would say, you know. Um, I like to kind of get things dialed in uh, and be really sure um, rather than kind of run fast and loose uh, and have things jump and it just it's just it, get things get complicated you never know 
you know, someone may say that's fine, but then when it comes, you know, to uh, push comes to shove, that it turns into a really expensive fence, you know. <laughs> yeah, and you got neighbors and, yeah. and everything. With a force like this, I mean, we've got, you know, maybe a thousand acres of woods around us yeah. connected to this, this uh, our farm. So, um, yeah, you guys did a great job. Thank great you. job, Thank yeah. You. So, again, uh, Mark, you're located in uh, Fairfield. I'll get your information and put it in this video. And uh, people want to contact you, they can just give you a call. Is that the best way to get a hold of you? Yep, just give me a call. Or um, I'm, I'm down at my bicycle shop called the Ride Bicycle Sales and Service. You can call there or stop in there. Um, if I can't help you, I can give you some advice. Um, I don't do as many burns as I'd like to um, because I have a, another full-time job, and I, I've noticed that's a, a problem in the burn world here. There's a lot of there's more and more people wanting to do burns, and there's less and less people doing burns. Now there are more. Uh, volunteer fire departments doing burns, so that's kind of taking up the slack. Um, but uh, yeah, that's just kind of an overview. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll make sure to put that uh, information uh, in the video so people know how to get a hold of you. And I want to thank you so much. It really turned out nice. It, thank uh, you. I'm uh, excited about it on this video. Um, we've got this conversation with Mark, and then I've, I took a lot of video when we, we did the burn. And I'm hoping to wait two or three weeks and get some post video uh, to see, you know, how some of the greenery is coming back. It's raining today, so mm -hmm. uh, it'll be interesting to know what it looks like two or three weeks from now. Yep. But thanks again. Thank you. All right. All right. I just thought it would be a good idea to, uh, you know, put a summary together. This is uh, two and a half weeks after the burn. So very similar footage. Uh, I think I have the camera in the same angle that I took for some of the burn, but you can really see a lot of things greening up. Um, I was amazed at how opened, how much the fire opened up the forest. Um, you know, not everything burnt, but uh, overall I'm extremely happy with the results of the of the forest burn. I'm, uh, I'm excited to see how what impact it had on the tick population this spring and summer. And um, it, although it didn't get all of the multiflower rows, um, I've got the picture coming up here um, in the video that uh, shows some multiflower rows that really got scorched and and uh, there's no blossoms, no blooming, no no sign of activity. So I'm. Um, uh, I'm hoping that I got rid of a lot of the basic species. Anyway, thank you for uh, sticking with me on the uh, tips and tricks from uh, Midwest Hunting and Outdoors by Two Dumbasses. Be safe, have fun, and get outdoors. Thanks for listening or watching our show. We have some exciting topics and guests coming up. We ask that you subscribe to our channel on YouTube and follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. We look forward to hearing your suggestions for topics, questions, and comments. This is Two Dumbasses signing off. Until next time, be, be safe, safe, have, have fun, fun, and, and get, get outdoors. outdoors.